Welcome. Uh, we're so happy you're here. Uh, my name is Fran Hackney. I'm a member of the uh, Social Science Curriculum Committee for HASP, and we're very happy to bring you today's session. A uh, couple announcements. Please take out your cell phones and silence them. Um, also, welcome to the crowd joining us on Zoom in the HASP virtual classroom, and a special thanks to our course technician, Nancy Mack, for supporting that hybrid modality. If you have questions and comments to pose at appropriate times, we kindly ask you to wait for the microphone so that all participants can hear you, especially the people on Zoom. As we approach the Thanksgiving holiday, it's a reminder that HASP, the HASP office is closed Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, November 22 to 24 next week. We wish you a warm and filling holiday. <laughs> Not too filling, hopefully. <laughs> So now I'd like to introduce our presenters. Uh, Pam Withrow is a retired prison warden uh, who will offer us uh, her perspective on prison and prison programs. She was the first woman warden in Michigan. I think she be, we, we had a session recently on internships and in reading her book from welfare to warden, I realized she started her career as an intern with the Department of Corrections and probably ended up in a career that she never expected. <laughs> but then uh, as she moved up into the administration part of the Department of Corrections, uh, she was the first woman to supervise a camp uh, for young uh, male prisoners, Camp Brighton. Uh, and then from there, she went to be a deputy housing uh, warden in, uh, I, in Jackson, which was a very difficult assignment and very challenging. And she did she did so well there. She moved on to become the first warden of an all-male prison at the Dunes in Saugatuck, Michigan. Most many of us have been to, to the Felt Mansion. So that's where the Dunes prison facility was located. It's gone now. Um, and then at, for her last 15 years, Pam was at the uh, Michigan Reformatory, uh, which is in Ionia. During her time at the Michigan Reformatory, and maybe even before, Pam initiated a cognitive restructuring program, which focused on uh, helping prisoners improve their behavior and become more aware of what were some of the underlying impulses that led to those destructive behaviors. Uh, that program is still in progress uh, in the prison system today, which is, uh, which is, was, was a great contribution on her part. Um, and then she has received many honors during her time as, as a warden. She was a recipient of the Nash North American uh, Association of Wardens and Superintendents. She has received two uh, honorary doctorates from Ferris and Grand Valley University. Um, she, she's retired now, but enjoys traveling and uh, She's written several books, and she's willing to do educational programs like this to help us learn more about the uh, prison environment. Our other presenter is Ron Hammond. Welcome, Ron. Ron was raised in Owasso, Michigan. He dropped out of school at the age of 16. Uh, he was convicted of uh, felony murder during a armed robbery at the age of 17. At that time, juveniles were often sentenced to life without parole, and that was true in his case as well. Due to the Supreme Court changes to sentencing for juveniles, he was resentenced uh, to a shorter term and um, was able to, uh, uh, during his time at the Michigan Reformatory, enter the uh, work on the cognitive restructuring program with Pam but then also enter the Calvin Prison Initiative Program as a student. So he uh, was, was paroled in uh, November of 2021. He then moved to Grand Rapids and entered Calvin University and is now completing his degree, uh, his BA in Human Resources. So I'm sure he will give us some helpful insights too uh, in terms of our prison system. So please welcome both Pam Withrow and Ron Hammond. Thank you. Um, 
Ron and I talked about how to approach us talking together about what the prison experience was for each of us. And we decided to do a chronological approach. Since he wasn't even a teenager when I started in the department, you're gonna to have to listen to me for a little while before he's ready to <laughs> chime in. Um, I also wanna mention that rattling the cage away out of the prison industrial complex uh, is a, an aspirational title, but not uh, something that I think I have the whole answer to. But as Ron and I talk today, uh, toward the end of our presentation, each of us will offer what we think is a way that the corrections business might be done a little bit better than it is currently being done. And of course, there'll be time at the end for you to ask questions. So with that as a prelude, um, I had I started in 76 with the department, had a couple jobs that were in good and a good introduction. I worked at the camp headquarters, then I worked in central office in the research and planning section. And after only two years, I found myself in charge of a prison camp, 140 uh, low security men, minimum security, and 12 male staff. This was the first time that a woman had given been given that opportunity, and I was wholly unqualified for the job. <laughs> um, the, my experience in central office had been helpful, and the camp was, was a little helpful. And I just said, frankly, to my staff, I don't know how to run this camp. You know how to do that. You teach me how to run the camp. I can work my connections in Lansing and at the camp headquarters, and we'll, we'll all get through this together. So most of the staff were pretty agreeable about that plan, except that the lieutenant, who was the highest ranking person next to me, um, he was supposed to teach me how to run a camp. And the first day he introduced himself, we, we talked, and pretty soon the sergeant showed up, the Fort of Midnight Sergeant. This guy was 6'2". And was quite full of himself. And the lieutenant, sensing that maybe this wouldn't go well, said, why don't we have our conversation in the office? So we went into the office. We're all standing up, the 6'2 guy and me and the intermediate size lieutenant. And the sergeant says, well, Supervisor Withrow, I want you to know that I'll give you my usual 110% until you hang yourself. And then I want to be the one to pull the trap door. I mean, gestures and everything. <laughs> I, I think maybe this guy practiced it. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, and I stammered something like, mm, you know, I hope you give me a chance or something like that. And the lieutenant was good. He, he just said, uh, maybe it's time for a tour of the camp. And I agreed that it was a time to get out of that office with this behemoth that was not very welcoming. Um, I had to pass him over for promotion twice before he decided to be a team player. But before I left the camp, I did promote him to lieutenant because he did turn out to be a good team player. It just took him a little while to get the get with the program. Um, camp Brighton was where I was introduced to what we called in the cognitive work, stinking thinking. Prisoners who felt like they were victims they had committed a felony, they were sentenced to prison, but they were the victims, not the people that they'd robbed or murdered. And we, and we had robbers and murders at this minimum security camp because they were getting ready to get out. The, and this puzzled me how they could feel so victimized. So I said to the Lutheran pastor who was our contractual chaplain, are, are you seeing this too? And he says, oh yeah, this happens. And I said, well, do you have some thoughts about how we might get around it? He said, yes, I do. Because <laughs> chaplains do, you know, they, they're good thinkers. He said, my um, parish volunteers out at Hillcrest Center. I didn't know what a Hillcrest Center was. And he said, it's a mental health facility just up the road. It was 15 minutes away. And they house multiply handicapped and developmentally disabled young people. And I think your prisoners should go there and volunteer. This is sort of rattling the cage stuff because prisoners don't go out and volunteer. But well, I always did. I had I convinced my supervisors that we'd have 15 guys in the program. They'd go out five at a time. I'd take them. 
We drive to Hillcrest and we helped the patients bounce on trampolines and make ice cream sundaes and play in the snow and make seed pictures. That was a challenging experience. And I remember so clearly watching these big burly prisoners take a damp washcloth and tenderly wipe the faces of the patients that they had enjoyed eating ice cream sundaes with. Cognitive dissonance, I want to tell you. It was, it was just an experience to see that. And then in the dark of the van on the way back to the camp, those discussions that the pastor and I had hoped for happened. Prisoners would say some variation of, those people don't even have a chance when they, if they ever get out of a place like they're living, they don't have any chance, but we do. We can do anything we want when we get out. Ta -da! <laughs> it was, I felt like it was a success. And then came the next challenge because the Hillcrest people liked what was going on so well that they wanted all 15 prisoners to go to Special Olympics in Howell, Michigan. Um, it was exciting, but it was also a little scary because to do this, my first obligation was the security of the camp. I had to get staff to rearrange their schedules so that two of them could go with me to the Special Olympics and the rest of them would rearrange things so that the camp would have coverage. And they did, I was, I was shocked. I think it may be in part because I'd worked doubles for during deer season so they could all go running, but <laughs> anyway, they, they did it. So that was good. And then I had to have the conversation with the prisoners because Special Olympics then and maybe still was held in April. And there were a lot of young girls that volunteered, young women who volunteered there. And I knew in spring, they wouldn't have on the big heavy coats that they'd have in the winter. They would be showing a lot of skin. And so I said to the prisoners, there's two things. Number one, Howell is the Michigan home of the KKK. So those of you who are black need to understand that there may be some issues there and you have to not respond. And they all nodded. And I said, the other issue is the young ladies. And I expressed my concern about their behavior with the young ladies. And they said, don't, it won't be a problem, Warden Supervisor. And it absolutely wasn't. They all went, they stayed with their assigned patient. They all came back to the camp at night, yay. Um, <laughs> and and it, it was it was a wonderful experience. And Hillcrest valued that so much that when I left and went to Jackson after the 1981 riots, they trained one of their staff to come out and that program continued to a whole crest closed. Jackson prison, after the riots in 81, Jackson, Marquette and the reformatory all had uh, major riots in 1981. So I got to go there as part of the cleanup crew. After riots in prisons, they throw out all the old rascals and they bring in new rascals. I'm not gonna claim that we, we were, who were brought in were wonderful. We were just different. So I got to go to Jackson as part of that crew. And I did a lot of walking and talking and listening because I'd learned at the camp that sitting in your office, you, you never, figure out what's really going on. You really have to be out there, seeing it yourself, hearing, especially from the prisoners, hearing the staff interaction with prisoners. All this is important. Well, at Jackson, it was even more important. And predictably, I was working late one evening and I heard the sound you don't want to hear, kaboom. Well, when a shot's fired in a prison, it either means that somebody's trying to escape or there's something really bad going on in the yard and they've fired a warning shot to try to break it up. So I got a few phone calls and none of them were making any sense. So I went out to the yard to see what was really going on. And what was going on was that there had been a fight on the yard and the officer in the tower had shot a guy and the guy that he shot was wearing kitchen whites, the clothes that kitchen workers wear, they're all white. And you might imagine the blood from the leg wound of this guy was pretty spectacular and prisoners were really, really upset. And the because we just had a riot, the staff in charge of the housing units 
all locked their doors. They didn't want upset prisoners coming into their units because something bad might happen in that case. So the first issue was get the doors open. That wasn't a problem. I was a housing deputy. I told them to open their doors. They did. Prisoners filtered in. The group of prisoners that came to me, because there's always self-appointed inmate reps. So the self-appointed inmate reps came and said, that guy they shot wasn't even involved in the fight. You got to take care of this. Dep, Dep, this, this is wrong. This was just wrong. Okay. You know, we need to investigate it. You guys need to go lock up. I will look into it. Well, as it turned out, <laughs> the prisoners were absolutely right. The officer confessed, and I don't think he realized the trouble he was going to be in for this. He said, well, you know, it was getting pretty dim, and there was a fight, and I couldn't get a bead on any of the guys that were fighting, and so I just shot the guy in the whites because I, I could get a good target with him. Um, <clears throat> the other staff did not think that our sanctioning of the officer who inappropriately shot somebody was a good thing. We thought it was. And of course, word got out to the prisoners that yes, indeed, the officer was wrong. And yes, indeed, the officer was sanctioned as a result. Um, and I think it helped the prison settle down after that. Uh, there was It was a tense place and it didn't ever get wonderful at Jackson Prison, but, but I really think that that helped. Um, Perry Johnson was the director of the Department of Corrections when I started. And Perry was a pragmatic man who knew that either he was going to introduce women into the prison business or the courts were going to let him tell him that he had to introduce women. So he took a rare, very proactive approach. He identified about a dozen women and he just promoted us so fast that our heads were spinning. I had six progressively responsible jobs in seven years. Yeah. And the other women that I got to know uh, through this experience, they were on that fast track too. So in 1983, I got the call from Perry that I was going to do, go to the dunes. Did any of you live in Holland in the late 70s, early 80s? Do you remember the fuss that there was about establishing the dunes? Yeah, <laughs> the Catholic Church had had a seminary in in the in the dunes, actually, between Holland and Saugatuck. The Felt Man Mansion was part of it. The facility itself was gorgeous. Long, curving hallway. The classrooms and the library were flooded with light. The architect was very imaginative. He, the dining room was like the prow of a ship, all glass looking out at the dune. We couldn't see the Lake Michigan. I think that would have been a deal killer, but, but we could see this beautiful dune between us and the lake. It was a gorgeous facility. And my other um, wardens, one of them said, Withrow, you've got the only joint in the country with marble mop boards. <laughs> Probably true. <laughs> For those of you who would like to see what the dunes look like when it still existed, I've got some, some uh, photos out in the hallway that you could take a look at. It's been raised since then. So I got to the dunes and it was running like a Swiss watch. It, everything was wonderful there, except that I was walking down the hall one day and said to a group of staff, hi, how are you doing? And I smiled like I, I'm a smiling kind of warden. And uh, as I got past the people, I heard one of them say, what do you think she meant by that? <laughs> <laughs> well, what I meant by that was, hi, how are you doing? Um, but I realized that for school staff, things were not wonderful. And fortunately, we had a little little bit of money in the budget that allowed us to hire a consultant. And I'm I'm really in favor of, if you don't know how to fix something, hire somebody that does and let them teach you. So we had a retreat. The school staff and I went off and and he gave us pencil and paper tasks to do. And we found out that I like change. What a surprise. I'm a person who likes to diagnose problems and fix them. School staff, on the other hand, like things not to change. They like it to be steady, consistent, predictable. And if there needs to be a change, they are professionals. They would like to be consulted. 
novel idea for somebody like me, who's pretty full of herself and thinks that, you know, she's running this prison, so she ought to be able to do stuff. So I learned from that experience. I'm very lucky that it happened early in my career. And to my delight, after we had had this um, experience, one of the school staff said, you know, we've got all these volunteers. And we did. We had about 400 prisoners and nearly 400 volunteers, many of them from Holland. She says, I, I do this job seeking skills course. And I bet some of those volunteers would come in and do mock interviews. Our guys create resumes. That would be cool if they'd come in and, and interview. And sure enough, we put out the word and we had all, all kinds of volunteers. And we did that twice before I went on to the reformatory. So I felt that was a win. The, the school staff, at least that one person, had forgiven me for my errors uh, of my ways. The, the different stuff, and this gets back to rattling the cage a little bit, because of the riots, Every May, we all got nervous because they were over Memorial Day weekend, and you didn't want your prison to be an anniversary blow up. That would not be good. So I put out the word that at the end of summer, if it had been a good summer, we would have Warden's Appreciation Day. And Warden's Appreciation Day meant that the Inmate Benefit Fund bought hamburgers and hot dogs and ice cream and the staff would cook the hamburgers and hot dogs and serve all the food to the inmates on the yard. That role reversal was really appreciated by the prisoners. That went so well the first year that the second year we decided to have donkey softball. Any of you ever seen donkey softball? I see some heads nodding. Uh, for those of you who don't know, donkey softball is an experience where a vendor brings in a trailer full of miniature donkeys and all of the people on offense are assigned a donkey. And when they get a hit or a walk, they and their donkey have to go around the bases. <laughs> and if you know donkeys, you know they're not always cooperative. It was so much fun. I mean, everybody was just laughing and laughing and having a good time. Some of the prisoners were so big, they just picked up their donkeys. <laughs> Off they went around the bases. It was great. So we did that. And then Christmas time came. And Christmas in prisons is a really sad time. Moms don't even come to visit sometimes at Christmas. So knowing that it was going to be sad, um, I decided to bring in a family tradition of mine, which is to bake cookies and share them with your friends. So I invited some prisoners who never got visits, and we all went down into the food service area, and we made cookies and cookies and more cookies. And then I brought in a silver punch bowl and some candelabra, and we had a candlelight reception for all the prisoners in that beautiful dining room that we had. And I suspended the rule about not taking food out of the chow hall. I, they could take all the cookies they could carry. <laughs> and I still grin because there were guys stuffing cookies down their shirts and off they went. They had, uh, that was just so much fun. I really enjoyed that. We did that twice before I got promoted. <laughs> and then I got the call that the reformatory warden's job was open and I should take a look at it. Well, I knew what that meant. It meant I was gonna be the warden at the reformatory. Uh, the reformatory was the oldest operating prison in the system, and it was for young guys, 17 through 21 when I took it. Later, the age went up to 26. It was also a prison that had been slated for closure, so no maintenance work had been done. It was under a federal consent decree as a result of the riots. There was a lot of tension between staff and prisoners, even in 1986, five years post-riot. And the staff, who had not enjoyed the riot very much, um, they thought that it was appropriate if a prisoner assaulted somebody on Fifth Gallery, that they drag him down the stairs by his heels with his head bouncing off the, the metal covered concrete steps and then bounce him off the wall all the, all the way down a hall across the rotunda and throw him in a cell in the adjustment center. Now, you probably have guessed that that is not the way I think prison work ought to happen. Um, we, the, the principles that we operate under is 
you can use only the force necessary to get control of a situation, no more. Well, this is obviously a violation of the use of force policy. And apparently none of the supervisors other than me <laughs> thought that that was a problem. My boss, um, when he placed me there said, you know, there's blood on the floor every day at the reformatory. And I said, no, I didn't know that, but I'll get on it. And it was true, it was staff or prisoners. Somebody was bleeding every day at that prison. And it wasn't the way that I wanted to do business. So um, I put out the word, we weren't gonna have any more of the successive use of force. I had to fire some people before they got the message, um, but they, they got fired. Nobody stays fired in state service, by the way. They, they eventually get their jobs back. Um, but I, I'm gonna tell one little prison story and then it'll be Ron's turn. So this one guy <clears throat> got knocked down in the chow, uh, an officer, knocked down in the chow hall, other staff came, they, they secured the prisoner. He was laying face down over a table. And the guy who had got knocked to the floor got up and just came with an uppercut and smuck this guy right in the face, the, the prisoner. Well, this was so egregious that even staff told on him. Staff never tell on each other, but this was bad. So I fired him. And of course, over time, between the Michigan Corrections Association, the Officers Union and Civil Service, he got his job back. But prisons are like small towns. Everybody knows everybody's business. And this officer happened to be a divorced man who was way behind on his child support. Somehow, magically and mystically, the, the Department of Social Service discovered that he was going to get a big paycheck. And somehow, they attached that paycheck. And he never saw a dime. <laughs> so life was good. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it wasn't too long after that that Ron came into my life. But first, he's going to talk about what went on before we met each other. Now, before I met Pam, I actually got to the reformatory about the same time she came to the reformatory. I came through quarantine at age 17 and entered. My first stop was the reformatory, which was known at that time as the Gladiator School. And it was a reputation that it was well deserved. That that's the type of facility it was. So if you've got teenage sons or teenagers, you know they can be a little rebellious. So imagine a facility of all 17, 18, 19 year olds who are under direct authority all the time. I was very adamant about not taking direction. Uh, DDOs were my staples. <laughs> I did not follow direct orders at all. Uh, insolence was second to that. So I would rack up tickets, but I learned something in a reformatory because when you come in, you have to protect yourself and it wears on you, that stress gets to you. So my first trip to the whole isolation was like a vacation because now you're behind bars 24 seven, nobody can get to you and you're safe. And you get to just decompress for months. And then you come back out and it starts again, that pressure, that pressure, that pressure. But I wasn't the only one. So what do we have? A thousand people at reform? So you have a thousand young men going through this same cycle. And this is what Pam entered into at the reformatory. So I would catch these tickets, catch these tickets, catch these tickets. So eventually my security went up and I was shipped out, I believe, to Jackson, four block. So I managed to get to Jackson four block before you were old enough really to go to Jackson. You were supposed to be 21. I think I got there just short of my 20th birthday. So I stayed down there probably nine months and Cindy Avery seen me walking down past her office. And she said, come in my office for a minute. She said, how old are you? And when I told her, she said, pack your stuff. And she shipped me to Marquette, which is a level five maximum security facility. And I stayed up there probably three years. And I think that time up there was probably the best thing that happened because I went from being a teenager to a young adult. So your brain starts to get mature and you start to think long term. And my points started to come down. I started not to catch so many tickets, which kind of felt good. And then they shipped me back to the reformatory. <laughs> <laughs> 
which, you know, at that time, I wasn't really happy about going back to the reformatory. But when I got there, I was older. And there's a hierarchy within the prison system. And it's the younger guys than the older guys. Once you've been there a while, you get a little more respect. Some of the things you do on the yard, your willingness to fight, uh, your willingness to act violently in response to aggression, gain, it gains you security. You don't have to do it as much anymore. And I had reached that point. Uh, and when I got to the reformatory, the second time, I was then able to then relax a little bit, but I still caught tickets, uh, one right after another. <laughs> I could not stop. I think I caught 50 in my first five years. So I racked them up, and I racked them up, and I racked them up. But the reformatory wasn't what it used to be. There wasn't as many fights. It was still violent. And there was a program on the TV that inside we had a TV station that, that was an inside station that they would show videos. And it also had the menu for the chow hall and different announcements. And they were announcing this STP program. And how'd you have it worded? If you have the courage to challenge yourself, sign up for this. <laughs> so it just said, the counselor come by one day, I think it was school you come by, he said, and he was talking to me. I said, man, why don't you tell the warden to get that off my TV? I don't want to see that no more. <laughs> and he said, you know, Ryan, he said, that program's for you. I said, no, it ain't. I said, I'm doing just fine. Just leave me alone. You know, that's all I want to do is just be left alone, do my time. This is where I'm going to die. And I think that's the other thing to, to look at. A lot of us at the reformatory were doing very long sentences. I was serving life without parole at the time. When you were in Michigan, that meant that's where you was going to die. Very few people walk out of prison from a life without parole sentence. So he says, well, I'll tell you what. He said, why don't you go into the program? He said, I'm not saying you have to change any way you do your time. You do your time the way you want to do your time. He said, the only thing I ask is that after you go through it, when I come visit you in the hole, don't tell me you don't know why you did what you did. <laughs> you know just own it you know that's that's all i asked so he eventually convinced me to go into the program and it was something that changed my life because without structure i was just drifting i still wasn't ready to completely change at that time but it started to get have i started to think a little different like how would my life have been different had i not made the choices i made as a teenager because once you start your time off like i said it was a dangerous place so your first initiation is just to survive everything you do is just to physically survive you don't have time to think about anything else but once you're able to reach that point where you can survive then you have nothing but time to think about what you gave up what did you know what did you lose by coming to prison and that's what started to eat at me every day what did i lose so about the time I entered that program, I was ready to make a change. I just didn't know what that change was yet. I was still trying to discover because at the time I was still young, still in my early 20s, and I was still in a very violent environment. And for me, it was, I have to survive in prison. However I have to do it, that was number one priority. There was nothing else, just what the rules on the yard was. And so STP was huge for me and i believe we're going to talk about that later so i'll let pam continue <laughs> on and when we get to SPP, we can dive into what those what that means to have an opportunity and that doesn't always come around in prison so when they come around to have those opportunities presented is, is very very big well as ron said things had settled down a little bit at the reformatory we had uh, the opportunity to have a christian rock group called dc talk come into the prison, they did a video called The Hard Way, and that involved a number of prisoner extras. Again, we were rattling the cage a little bit. Uh, I don't think that had ever happened inside a Michigan prison before. They picked what was one of the coldest February days that I can recall, and we did some of the filming in housing units. That was nice. It was warm, but some of the filming was out on the yard and a little bit of it late in the day was 
outside the walls of the prison. And I got to be the, the person who stood out there with them as they finished up their video. It was interesting to see the video made, but oh man, it was cold. Uh, we also had NBC Nightly News with Brian Williams come in. He was a hunk back then. Um, <laughs> we had Jackie Lydon with National Public Radio's Weekend Edition. She came to do a piece about juvenile lifers. She was way ahead of her time, recognizing that locking up a young people for the rest of their life for what were serious crimes. It's, I'm not minimizing the crime they committed. I'm just saying they didn't understand completely the ramifications of the act that they'd committed. And the Supreme Court finally got around to acknowledging that and said, let's take another look at these guys. Uh, Entertainment Tonight came in, and I still can't remember why they came, but it was probably juvenile lifers because you know. we had Cal Thomas come with the prison fellowship group. About 200 citizens came in and had dinner with inmates. Um, that was a rattling the cage experience. We started an uh, accreditation process and got the facility accredited, even though my bosses in Lansing were quite convinced that that was not something that could happen at the reformatory. And we worked our way through most of a federal consent decree and we weren't out from under it yet, but we didn't have nearly as many experts coming in to make sure we were doing what we should be doing. And that's when the STP business started. I took a team to Colorado this is where your tax dollars were at work because the National Institute of Corrections out of Washington, D.C. has an academy out in Colorado where they serve people that are in the corrections business and offer training in a wide variety of areas. I had training in management and leadership and dealing with riots and disturbances. Thank goodness to never have to use that. Um, I can't remember another one that I don't recall now. But when they came out with a program called Cognitive Approaches to Changing Offender Behavior, I was in because I had a whole bunch of young men that needed their behavior changed, and I was willing to do it anyway that that was legal. So I took a team out there. Um, we came back wanting to do cognitive restructuring, realized we did not know what we were doing. How do, how do you put a program like that together? So again, your tax dollars work. We asked the National Institute of Corrections for some grant money. They gave us the money. We hired some people who were already running a program to come to Michigan and tell us how to set up our program. And we ended up with STP. STP stood for Strategies for Thinking Productively. We chose STP because that's also an acronym about some kind of magic oil that's supposed to make your car run well. We thought the young guys might resonate to that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so STP was in three phases. Phase one was the same as group counseling, which almost all prisoners, when they come through reception, one of the things that they're told they should do while they're locked up is go to group counseling. So phase one was simply informational. We told guys how you think, control how you behave, some tools to learn how you think, our thinking reports. Another uh, tool is a journal. These are thinking errors. Everybody has thinking errors, but if they go a little bit beyond the usual, then there are errors that can get you into trouble. And this was a 16 session uh, program. We did it over eight weeks and everybody, that was locked up uh, in our minimum security dorm and inside the walls were, that were eligible to participate. And we had guys sign up because they were getting, they were ticking a box. They could uh, move on from their reception center recommendation. Then the phase two was a two year commitment and it was limited to men who were serving for violent offenses and prisoners had to volunteer. They had to say, I will agree to stay at the reformatory, a not very pleasant place for two years. And I will live together with other prisoners who are in the program in the oldest part of the prison. We let them pick the color of their cells and paint their own cells. That was a perk. We got a color TV, which didn't happen anyplace else to put in the day room. And we had a little vegetable patch out back because this used to be the segregation unit. So there was a fenced yard. So they got a vegetable patch. So those were the perks of being in STP phase two. The difficulty was that guys were assigned to group groups of about eight. 
And three times a week, the group would meet. And at each meeting, one man would spend the whole hour to hour and a half time presenting his thinking report about a situation that got when he got into trouble and all the thoughts he could remember about that situation and the attitudes and beliefs that supported that thinking and if he could remember any emotions that he felt. And I will tell you at the beginning, the only emotion anybody could identify was anger. Anger, anger, everybody was angry all the time. We had to get a little sheet that we, what, what we called it feeling faces. And it showed little faces showing different expressions with the label of the emotion that might match that expression. So that guys would get a clue that there is a way to feel other than angry. So to finish phase, and there were two staff, the two staff who were in this were not participants. They were there to keep order, to make everybody sure everybody showed up, to make sure that the prisoners were doing the work that they had committed to do. But staff were not there as therapists or treatment people or anything else. They were just there to keep order and make sure things were moving along. To get out of phase two, you had to do two things. You had to do a thinking report about the crime that brought you to prison, sometimes a difficult experience, and you had to complete a relapse prevention plan. Now that you understand the thinking that's getting in you into trouble, what new attitudes and beliefs are you going to adopt so that you don't continue to think in a way that gets you into trouble? And that relapse prevention plan sometimes had to be presented to a treatment team. This was a group of staff several times before it was clear enough and simple enough that we felt that the prisoner who, had, who was presenting it could actually do it. So then if they graduated from phase two, most of them went to lower custody because by now they'd gotten a handle on their behavior, their points were down, they were eligible for reduced custody and we encouraged them to go. Number one, we needed the beds for really bad guys. But number two, this was a good test. If, if they really had absorbed the information from the program, they could do that at another prison. They didn't need to be at the reformatory. If they moved into phase three, they had to leave their cozy little place, living with other guys who were doing the program and go back to general population. That was hard. They only met once a week in group and groups weren't for thinking reports anymore. They were to talk with each other about how they were doing with a relapse prevention business and they journaled. That's how Ron and I got to know each other because I was Ron's journal partner because <clears throat> staff said, um, uh, Ron Hammond's going to go into phase three. And I said, I'll, I'll be his journal partner. He said, well, why do you want to be his journal partner? I says, he just thinks he's all that. And I think, and, and he's bright. And I think it'd be a challenge. And so I want to be his journal partner. And so Ron and I worked together in phase three for know, six, eight months, maybe a year. It was a while. So the thing that I added to phase three was what was called warden's dinner. This was a skill building activity. And the warden's dinner was, I brought in placemats, uh, cloth napkins, real dishes, real glasses, silverware, serving um, utensils. And we got food from the chow hall, but it was served family dinner style. We had a moment of silence before we started to where people could say thank you to whatever god or goddess they believed in. And then <clears throat> we passed food and we had conversation. And it was clear that this was not an experience that many of these guys had had. So one time the, the inmates did the dishes at the end of the dinner and I counted things, made sure we got everything back. <laughs> it was my job. Um, but one night while they were doing dishes, I said, you know, this business of, um, uh, of, Family dining, the family style dining seems to be unfamiliar. Is what what you got? I mean, didn't you do this at Thanksgiving or Christmas and other times? And one of the fellows said, No, if I was hungry, I just told mom's and she gave me some money and I go down to the corner. Hmm. For somebody like me who grew up in a strong family constellation with a big extended family and lots of big family dinners and lots of um, socializing in a way that made me 
pretty wolf following. Um, this was sad. I mean, I, I was sad to hear this. So we, we only had five guys. The most we had in phase three was five. With me, it's six. So we had two seats for warden's dinner. So sometimes we'd invite other staff who were working in the program. And sometimes just because I always like to push the envelope, I'd invite staff that I knew were antagonistic, that were, you know, they were always letting people out late or they were not signing passes or what, whatever they could do to fool with the program. And, you know, it's harder to be antagonistic to a group of people when you sat down and broken bread with them. So that strategy worked just a little bit. I had fun with that. Grand Valley State University agreed to research STP and they, they wanted to uh, do research on phase one as well as phase two. And I said, yeah, don't, you know, don't waste your time on phase one. That, it, it's just information. I can't imagine it's gonna do anything. And they said, no, no, we, we want both. So Agnes Barrow, Dr. Agnes Barrow was the head researcher. And she did a matched group, which is one of the strongest, for those of you who do research, one of the strongest kinds of research designs that you can have. So we had guys who volunteered for STP and guys who were in other voluntary self-help programs like school, religion, AA, NA, other activities who were considered self-help. Well, lo and behold, when, you, when the research started coming in, there was a statistically significant decrease in disobeying a direct order misconduct, the one that Ron was most involved with, and which is the most frequent misconduct in all of the prisons, statistically significant reduction in the SDP guys. Win. It's a win for you as taxpayers because under the timekeeping system that was in place then, and I think is still around, um, prisoners who got a misconduct in a month sentenced themselves to another week in prison. They couldn't be paroled sooner than that extra week. So if you got a misconduct in this month, you got another week, next month, another week, the next month, another week, you know, it adds up after a while. So that was a bonus, I thought, for the taxpayers. And also because disobeying a direct order of misconduct sometimes escalates into more. So that the, the inmate says, F no, and the officer says, yes, you will. And then the inmate says, I won't. And then the, pretty soon they're bumping chests and rolling around on the floor. And this is not good. So I was really glad that this was happening. And then when she did the research on phase two, DDOs, <clears throat> they were significantly, statistically significantly reduced. But the best part was assaults were too. And assaults are the thing that you really want to get a handle on and, and for the inmates to get a handle on. So they stopped hurting each other and my staff. So that was exciting when that happened. So I'll let switch off here a minute yeah. and let uh, Ron talk about STP from well, his yeah, point of view. I mentioned earlier, I entered STP more as a challenge to my young manhood. <laughs> so that's why I entered phase one. But during my entering of phase one, I also enrolled in non-com community college because college was offered well growing up i was told that i was too dumb to pass school i basically got d's and e's in school since the time i started uh, i grew up in an abusive household and so that's where i became my who i was it helped to shape me and i had that victim stance you made me this way you know that's why i'm, I'm the victim but when I enrolled in Montcalm, I got that first report card and it was all A's. And I remember sitting that night at the edge of my bed, just crying because I realized what I had did, what the potential I had was that I gave up. So now here I am in this STP program and I have an opportunity now to start discovering more about myself. So when I got to phase two and the facilitators basically sat back and the guys ran the group, I became the individual who would then challenge the person given the weekend report. Instead of just saying, yeah, I agree with you. You know, you were right to act that way. I was the one to question 
your role in that? What choices did we have? What responsibility did I have and how I was responding? Uh, I like to, the nice thing about SDP was it helped slow down the thinking process. So in my position, if you called me a name when I was a little kid, I thought about it for a couple of minutes and then I hit you in the mouth. <laughs> By the time I was 12, if you called me a name, I thought about it for about 30 seconds and then hit you in the mouth. By the time I reached high school, you didn't get to finish the sentence. That thought process from thought to action became so short that it became an automatic response. That is what became for us was, I don't know why I did it. STP slowed that down. Every time you examine those situations and those thoughts and those feelings and what you was going through, you began to see that there was a thought pattern. Every situation had the same pattern. And then you got to put in that red light, that stop sign and say, hey, stop and think about this. The last time you did this, it resulted in this consequence. What if I take another choice? What if I take another path? And so I began to change and I didn't catch as many tickets. And then I wanted to develop a life within prison, but what life is there? I mean, really prison is a small community. It's a small city. You come out, you work, you got a job, you go to the yard, you go to the commissary. You can build some type of life, but that really has no meaning. It's just monotonous, same thing day in, day out. And I wanted something with more meaning, but I didn't think I could have it. And so I ended up in phase two and we was going through phase two for a while and there was staff that were against it and they were pushing. I was just tired of dealing with it. And I was like, man, how do you complete this? And at the time there was no process for completing the program. We were just there. We were the ones starting it. No one knew how to complete it. And as Pam said, there's self-appointed prisoner representatives and I elected myself that person. And <laughs> I sent her a letter and it was like, Hey, you got us here. How do you, how do we complete? And I listened to this whole list of complaints that I had about what was going on. And she said, well, let's talk about it. She brought all SDP phase two over into the chapel and we had a discussion. Over it. And at the end, I said, well, how do you complete? She said, well, we still don't know how to do that yet. So I asked to leave the program. I was like, okay, then I'm done. I just went out. So we were in the grades over in G block and upstairs was all phase two and downstairs. What was that at the time? Intake? I think so. So they moved me out of, out of my spot upstairs and put me down in intake and said, we'll find a spot. Well, my counselor at the time at phase two was my journal partner at the time. She was like, well, we want you to come back to group. And I was like, no, she said, well, we'll leave you over here to think about it for a while. And they left me over there and they kept on leaving me there and they would just move me strategically around that spot. And I said, why do you keep on moving? They said, because we move you to where the guys downstairs are loud and unruly because when we move you, you get them to calm down. I then I didn't know I had developed this role, but <laughs> <laughs> that was my role. And then one day she come to my office not to my office, but to her office, she called me and she's like, hey, you know, you've done everything it takes to complete. You know, here's the list. Why don't you apply to complete in phase two and go into phase three? So I filled it out, did the did a relapse prevention plan and everything. And they called us into the committee meeting. We were sitting in there and Pam was in there and some other members were in there and they do the interview when they're done. I think it was Jay Kimbrell said, well, yeah, you've done everything, but you've been out of group for a while. I think you should go back to group. And I'm like, no, I'm not going back to group. <laughs> and they said, well, what if you just journal? I said, well, I'm going to be willing to do that. So I wanted to turn to Miss Kingster and say, you want to journal again? And before I got it out of my mouth, he turned to Pam and said, you don't have a journal partner, do you? <laughs> <laughs> so that's how Pam ended up my journal partner. And for me at the time, it was kind of nervous because you're journaling one-on-one -on -one with the warden of the facility. And it doesn't, and how do you just, how do you explain that to your peers on the yard? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> that wasn't going to go over so well because <laughs> not only do you, when you go into phase three, do you complete phase two, but you also transition back out into the general population block. But I did it. And I came into, I said, well, you know what? Here's someone who understands how corrections works. And I don't know what I want but I want to understand how to live in this environment. How do I do it? You know, I guess manipulation is a strong word. Uh, I like to take my ethics professors right now stance that, hey, sometimes the art of persuasion is you have to make people like you to, in advance in order to get somewhere So and to prepare. So I started picking Pam's brain about how things work. What do wardens look for? And for her, it was, it can't cost no more money than I'm already spending, <laughs> and it better not threaten security. And then I may be open to it. Maybe not, but, you know, you're going to get a lot of no's. So I would pick her brain and pick her brain. But then she started to get to me, you know, and we would work and we would work. And one day I told her, I said, you know, I'm going to die here. She said, yeah, you very well could. She said, but ask yourself Corrections runs on this pendulum. When the economy is really, really good, people don't mind spending money to keep you locked up. They feel safe. But when the economy is bad, people start looking for a way to cut the budget. And in corrections, that becomes the mean, how do we let people go? And this pendulum goes back and forth, back and forth. When that pendulum swings, you don't have time to then make change. The change has to happen before the pendulum swings. So you ask yourself, are you going to be okay with where you are when it changes? And if you are, hey, by all means, you know, continue doing what you're doing. But if you aren't, what changes can you make? And for me, that that was the the capsule. I was... I was all in and I really began then looking at how do I build a life within prison. And so I started volunteering for them. So teddy bear projects, making teddy bears that would then get sent out to the community to first responders. Uh I taught myself to crochet. We did blankets for uh veterans and uh blue star mothers, not gold star mothers. We we did those for a while and then you just program after program after program, garden projects where the food would get donated. Uh, I started volunteering to be on the warden's form. Uh, I went from wanting to work in the factories to wanting to become a tutor to help people then who were struggling like I was. And I eventually land, landed in a role as a tutor for a uh, reentry uh, for skills development for career employment employment readiness i believe we called it mm -hmm. employment readiness so sdp did that for me it prepared me for that it got me to open up my eyes and pam worked with me step by step along that path and i eventually left the reformatory she kind of pushed me like hey it might be time to go <laughs> you've been here long enough and so i left and i went to level two imax and you get to be the worker down in the max unit, but it was new. It was wide open. It was one of those pole barns. And I had spent my whole, pretty much my whole life in a nine by six, is that what they are? And by myself, I didn't have to live with nobody else. I couldn't sleep. Uh, Cindy Livingston, who then had been remarried by then, was Cindy uh, Livingston. She used to be Cindy Avery, my old counselor at in Jackson, she came into my cube one day and she was like, you know, you haven't been outside since you've been here. It's about time you go outside. I said, no. I said, uh, can you just send me back over to the reformatory? <laughs> <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, you know, I had a conversation with Pam Withrow and she told me one day you was going to make that statement to me. <laughs> <laughs> and she told me to tell you that door is closed. You're not coming back. So I was stuck there and I struggled and I ended up falling back into some mall ways, just hustling the yard, and manufacturing alcohol and selling it on the yard to make a living. And I found myself 
back up at a higher level. And I'm sitting there, I said, man, I said, how did I get here from everything I had done? And I realized that change comes in stages. You can know what is the right thing to do. You can put me in the classroom. You can put me in STP. You can give me those skills. But if you've never applied those skills, how do you then you learn to use those tools when it gets to, when it becomes difficult, you go back to what you know best. You go back to how you can survive. And that's what I did. I mean, I can manufacture alcohol from almost anything. So <laughs> I, the, the last episode that got me kicked out, I think I got 120 people drunk in one unit in that house. <laughs> <laughs> that had me set up. But I sent Pam a letter and I said, look, I said, you know, I'm struggling. I relapsed. I said, I really need to get back to STP where I can at least have a journal party. And she suggested that I go back to Carson City. She said, it's not guaranteed. I talked to your warden that even with two wardens in agreement that it will happen. But a miracle. And the next week I was at Carson City back in doing journaling for STP. But it had taught me that when you're given something, you also have to have a responsibility. That when someone helps you, that's just a help along. You have a responsibility in that too. And so that was pretty much how I think the end of our STP journey is that realization that she had given me the tools and now it was on me to then take the responsibility to start applying them. And I did it from pretty much from that point on. Yep. Well, <clears throat> we'd had so much fun with STP and people that volunteered, we decided to try a not voluntary cognitive program. I'm not going to describe it entirely because it didn't go well. <laughs> um, the prisoners were unhappy. We got Ferris to... Uh, do the research. After a relatively brief time, Ferris said, uh, you're, you're making the prisoners worse, not better. You, you probably ought to do this. And so I got with our director and said, we're shutting it down. He said, yes. And shortly after that, I retired, um, which was fun for me. And it was great for my husband, who'd been a supporter all these years that I'd been off warden wardening. And now we could travel and have time with our grandkids and life was good. Uh, I didn't do any corrections work except one contract where I went out to um, a, a prison out west and helped to make the video that was used na nationwide to train uh, staff in the implementation of the Prison Rape Elimination Act. And the, the, I did it because it was close to my heart because I'd see these young guys come to the reformatory scared out of their wits and they were fodder for the predators. And so PREA was really an important law and I wanted to do what I could to help it be implemented properly. So I did that little bit for corrections. I did some volunteering in Michigan. To, um, our, our first woman director in corrections built on a leadership program that we had for everybody and had leadership training for women. And she asked me and another of my buddies to to come and be um, kind of proctors for this thing and lend our wisdom that we gained over the years. And I did that several times and it was great fun. Um, they gave me a bed and a place and food. I thought that was good. Um, and then of course there was some cognitive training and I went, I volunteered to help with that because I thought it was important also. So I was going along happy in my retirement and I got a letter at home from Ron Hammond, who was a prisoner still. That makes you nervous when you've been in the prison. <laughs> I mean, how he got my home address, I didn't know, but I didn't like it very much. Um, but his letter was was quite laudatory and, and it was, you know, it thanked me for helping him get his act together and described how his life was going now in prison. And, and this was not too long after the Supreme Court, US Supreme Court had said, Young men who committed their crimes when they were under the age of 18 should be reviewed for possible resentencing. So my old warden antenna was up and I kept reading this letter and it was a long letter. 
and waiting for him to say, and would you come and testify for me at my resentencing hearing? But the letter didn't say that. It just ended with, and I've got to thank you because I've got a decent life now. So I was kind of blown away. Um, several months later, his attorney then did contact me. And she said, I, I'm wondering if you might be willing to speak for Ron if he goes before the judge for resentencing. And my reflexive answer was no, but it didn't come out of my mouth because I learned in STP that you have to stop and think. And so I stopped a minute and said, in all my career in corrections, I never advocated for a prisoner to be released. On the other hand, no other prisoner has stayed in touch with me over the years. And Ron Hammond, after he left the reformatory about every year or two, I'd hear from him what was going on in his life. I thought, well, you know, maybe, I, maybe I owe a little bit to this guy. So I asked the attorney if she could get me an appointment to visit with him, and she did. And I went to the Michigan training unit where he was living. And the last time I'd seen Ron Hammond, he was this slender, young guy that just was had the world by the tail and thought he had his warden conned, and he was doing well. And then I met with him at MTU. And he was like he is today, kind of a graying guy that had little evidence of lots of starchy food in the prison system. Uh, not that I uh, haven't enjoyed my share of it. Um, and but but the sense of calm and peacefulness that he brought into that interview room just blew me away. And we talked and and uh, at the end of our conversation, he said, uh, you know, Warden, it really doesn't make any difference if I get resentenced. I've elected a life of service, and I can be of service if I'm locked up in prison, or I can be of service if I'm released. Okay. <laughs> I didn't have any response to that. I was, I'm, I was blown away. I'd never, I'd never heard an offender state so calmly how he was approaching life now. And, and it was just very touching to hear. The attorney and I drove away and she taking me back to my house. And I said, if it comes to it, I will testify. I, I, uh, I think Ron really is a changed person. I don't think he's a danger to the community. I'll testify. Well, things worked out and he did get a term of years and I'll give it back to you so you can talk about that. Yeah, so I went through my resentencing. I got resentenced. And then it became a reality that I was coming home. I, mean, I was in at the time when I was going through my resentencing. I was in the I had begun the Calvin Prison Initiative Program, and I was probably two years into it. So Calvin had come along and offered me an opportunity to do what I've been seeking. When I was in STP, I was looking for something. It offered me an opportunity to then be able to take on a role of leadership within the environment I was that would have an impact on the community that I had harmed. The idea for Kelvin was to have those of us who were doing long-term census, they really wanted nothing but lifers. Uh, Warden Burton pushed back and he wanted guys that were also going home. And the thought was, if we can train these guys to go out and be leaders, we can send them out in two. Uh, kind of like Jesus sent out to the disciples, sent them on pairs to uh, different facilities to have an impact on those facilities. So that was our goal. And I was like, man, this is what I've been looking for. You're going to give me the tools to do what I want, to actually have an impact on the community that I'd hurt because the people we would be helping change would be going home. And most of the crime that's committed are from people who come to prison and go back home and come back. The repeat offenders. It isn't the long-term sentence guys that happen to go home. It's the ones doing a little bit of time. And these are the ones that we wanted to reach out to. So I had settled into that. This is what I was going to do. And then when I got resentenced, it was like, now what? You know, how can I do that when I go home? And if I go home. And then it became, I don't even care. I mean, I would like to go home, but if I don't, I have a life here. This is, this is where God intends me to do my work. This is what I do. If it's at on the streets or if it's in here. 
So when Pam come to see me, that was a conversation we had had. And one of the hardest things I did was go back and do these things and really see the impact that my choices in life had had on my victim. And so when I come home, my goal now has become to ensure to do my part to help others coming home behind me, not to reoffend, not to not to create another victim. Because it's hard. It's hard when you see somebody whose life has been completely destroyed. Uh, the sister of the young man that I shot, her whole life has not been a sister, a mother, or an aunt. She has become identified as the sister of a murdered victim. She has been so angry and bitter for 30 some 40 years that her whole life has been destroyed. And I did that. I don't want someone else to go through that. So I changed my degree from faith and community leadership and a social work degree to a human resource management because one of the key things about coming home is to have a job. And not just a job, an entry level job, but a meaningful job, something that gives back. So I would like to be able to influence the hiring of people and the promotion of people up through. And how do you how do you do that? And I'm not sure, but I think one of it is to move up myself and, and take a role and gain a leadership role. And Pam has helped me to develop that leadership skills and abilities. Calvin has helped me. And I take those responsibilities for what they've given me serious now. Unlike when I first left the reformatory and went to IMAX and reverted back, I now understand that these things come with a responsibility. And that means to do the work that when it becomes difficult to continue for going to school and working full time is not easy. Uh, <clears throat> I work third shift from 11 to 7 a.m. Um, then I go to school every day. And so it's been difficult. And Calvin has not made it easy. They've asked for some responsibility in order for them to pay for my, continue to pay for my education. I must carry a B. Must carry a 3.0 in every class or else I have to pay for it myself. So that requires the dedication to put into the work. And uh, I hopefully that translates to when I talk to others who are coming in my position to say, look, it comes with work. If you want to make the change, it comes with work. And I know we're going to get into the perfect system later on yeah. here in a little shortly. But one of the things I'd like you to keep in mind is that when you start thinking about what people need, one of the things I needed most is what Pam gave me, the opportunity to take responsibility. And then to hold me accountable for that. You know, there has to be accountability. You can't just say here. There has to be some accountability to that. Accountability to those who give me the, the victims that we have, because we've all, I, I have never met a prisoner that said, you know, hey, he wasn't a victim uh, or he was not forced to do what he did. So you have to take that ownership going all the way through the entire process. Start. Okay. Do you want to describe your system or shall I go first? Oh, my system? Yeah. Well, yeah, because Pam's is a little more radical than mine, which is kind of uh which is kind of unique that you know you would think that the warden would be a little more strict, but it turns out that 36 years after serving 36 years in prison, I I'm a little more strict than Pam. So I don't want to overturn the system. I just think there's some fundamental flaws to the system. And instead of throwing the baby out with the bathwater, one of the things that corrections does is they give you some tools. However, they only give you they own they give you some tools. They give you some tools. You, there's some programs available to guys coming home. However, those tools are not given to you until the end. So a guy with a substance abuse problem doesn't take substance abuse until he's within a year of going home, maybe. If you have an anger management problem or a violence problem, you don't take, you know, those uh, solve up offender programs until you're like at the back end of the year, you're getting ready to go home. Where for me, those programs should happen when you step through the door. You should be given those tools and then held accountable, much like Pam did with SDP. I'm giving you the tools 
to help you act how you should and make the choices that you should. And then we can sit back and monitor you. I'm not an advocate that everybody should have an opportunity to come home. I think everybody should have an opportunity to earn the chance to come home. But coming home is never earned. It's an act of mercy. And my sentence was not uh, something that I could ever earn, my resentence or my parole. It was simply an act of mercy by society. But Pam had given me the tools to make those changes. So that's one thing. Now, vocational training, it shouldn't happen early on. It should happen at the back end because those skills change on a regular basis. So that's my perfect system. And then the other is, as a society, we need to stop with the knee-jerk reaction. When something bad happens, it doesn't mean you cancel the program. People are broken. It's going to happen. Uh, I've applied for jobs and they've said, no, you can't have it because of my criminal background. But I often ask them, have you ever had someone steal from you? Yeah, that's why I don't want nobody with a felony. Well, the person that stole from you didn't have a felony. <laughs> they were just broken. It's just the nature of man. We're broken and bad things are going to happen. So when you give people an opportunity and a second chance, there's going to be some that's going to take advantage of it and bad things are going to happen. But when we have this knee jerk reaction where we get rid of the program, we just crush everything. Then you're right back to square one with nothing. It has been my experience that when you allow people to have success and you held some accountability and you stick to that and you're consistent about it, those on the fringes that say, well, it's just a game. They now see that it's serious and they change their behavior. Most people are not leaders, they're followers. So they're either gonna follow those doing the wrong thing or they're gonna follow those doing the right thing. So when you leave that program in place, those who are doing the right thing can then begin to set that living example for the majority that sits in the middle and they will start to follow that guy. Shall we show the videos before, before yeah. we finish up here? All right, we got a couple videos from Kelvin Prison Initiative. Uh, Today because you earned it. This is the result of your efforts, your hard work, and your dedication. We have been given an incredible privilege with this education. And now it is our privilege to serve others with the gifts that we have been given. I hope that the education you have earned and the degree bestowed upon you today inspires those around you, those in your family, and your friends here on the inside with confidence and belief that they can achieve anything they set their mind to, just as you have. now has a college program.
The Calvin Prison Initiative is a five-year bachelor's degree program that equips students in the Michigan Department of Corrections to serve their community. We equip them with skills for peer mentoring, for academic tutoring, and for peer support. It focuses on the fact that education is transformative, not just informative, and so it's more about who the person you become. It's about becoming a better person. It's another thing to do it Christ-based, and I think that is just something different that we do, and um, I, that's one of the main reasons why I just love CPI. Jesus has called us to transform this world, and that's what we're trying to do. When Jesus says, you visit me in prison and I'll be there, it's been my experience that I've seen Jesus here. I mean, that's just amazing if that can happen. It changes the prison itself in terms of its culture, its sense of community, its sense of people having a purpose. It's very inspirational, and it really, it gets deeply into your heart. One of my most exciting uh, times to teach is coming to prison. Uh, these students are so eager to learn, and they ask all sorts of questions. I know each semester going in that I'm, I'm working with students who are excited about learning. It's immediately rewarding. They do not take this lightly. They realize this is a great gift, and with that gift comes a great responsibility. It creates uh, an opportunity for an individual to begin to be formed the way that I think God created us to be had no idea that this much growth would uh, actually take place though. I was always scared to step out and help because I didn't feel like I had the skills, I didn't have the, the, the tools, I didn't have the know-how, I didn't have the, the knowledge to help one, uh, another person. I now have the, the confidence to go out and to help people. There's no limit to what we can do. What the CPI program has done is given guys hope, It's given guys an extra life. It's turned a vague ideal into reality. We have this uh, kingdom renewal going on. So it's the relationships, it's, the, it's the, the helping others to be the best that they can be. My hopes for CPI would be that they would potentially extend their footprint. Right now they're in Michigan, but maybe to inspire other Christian schools to do the same thing. We see many, many avenues by which our students are serving. I think that you would agree that the investment you make in that system, that institution, and what that potential is to change people's lives is worth so much more than what you could provide. It is one of the more rewarding programs that we have invested in, and I feel like it's an investment. It's an investment in people. We just firmly believe that education is the key to success, um, no matter what your circumstances. You can always make yourself a better person. I would like to encourage people to support this program financially because of all the benefit it has in our community let alone the benefit it has for the, for the specific student. Um, it's a beautiful thing to see. Don't we want to show kindness and of ourselves? Yes. Don't we want to help somebody else? Yes. Don't we want to help ourselves by, by having a program like this that benefits our whole community? And so by supporting this program, we're participating in all those good things. We're able to be human again in prison. We see a humanity within the CPI program that I've never seen in prison, and it's because of the donors that make that possible. It enables me to live a life that is fulfilling, that's gratifying, and able to pay forward that which donors have given that we might have this opportunity. That makes life worth living. Okay. So I know that we've used up all of our time here, but I'm going to give you the short version of my vision of what prisons ought to be like. I, I see a three-tiered system that prisoners come in just like they do today. They get a prescription at reception for the things that they should do. Then they get to choose. 
If they choose not to do any of them, they go to a prison that's absolutely no frills. They, they don't have work, they don't have school, they don't do anything. They go to their cell, they get the court mandated amount of um, out of cell time, they get three meals, that's it. The TV that's in their cell only gives educational programs and religious services, that's it. The next tier is guys who want to participate and they get everything. It's a rich environment, college, you know, everything that can make them better human beings and all the things that reception offers them. And then the third tier is for prisoners who've completed all their reception um, uh, requirements, they go and live in dormitories or apartments. And they're sort of like what you see in some of the upscale colleges where four people live in an apartment, each has their own room with a bathroom, they have a common space with a place to prepare meals and to, to recreate. At this point, they get an industries job and they get paid minimum wage. Now the state is providing their housing so they don't have to pay for that, but they do have to buy their own food. They have to cooperatively with their, cooperatively with their roommates figure out meal plans and, and feed each other. They have to keep the place clean. There will be a laundry so they can do their laundry. In effect, they become within a prison, fully functioning human beings, just like they'd be on the streets. And staff's role in, in this third phase is just to come in and make sure that basic hygiene standards are being met. Otherwise, they basically leave them alone and let them run their lives. So that's my plan and it is pretty radical, <laughs> but, but I'd like to see it happen. And the, the last piece of that is people living in the apartments when they reach age 50, they get reviewed for either commutation or parole. Because the reality is that hardly anybody past age 50 is really a danger to us in the communities. We pay a lot of money in this country because we're mad at people. That's what we're paying for when we hold most prisoners past age 50. We're mad at them and we're gonna make them spend their whole life in prison. And it's A, it's a waste of the human life, but B, it's a waste of our taxpayer dollars. <laughs> so I would at least let them get looked at for parole. And Fran, I'm sorry, we've used up all of our time. I don't see. <laughs> uh, let's see, we might have uh, two minutes for any, any questions. Thank you. Since you spent most of your time in prison and then you talked about going home, where was home? Oh. Well, I'm home for me is a wassail, but I actually went home to Grand Rapids where I knew nobody. I went straight to the school. They provided me with a place to go to. Uh, Living Waters Ministry accepted me, and that was my first stop. It was Living Waters. And I've moved, got my own job now, and me and Jen just bought a house, uh, closed on that a couple of weeks ago. So in two years, I went from housing provided to me to buying my own. There's a comment in the chat. It's from um, Judy Zeidlin. It says, Landis and I had the privilege to meet students in the Hope Prison Program. I'm totally convinced that this is a most important program that we can know about and encourage others to know and support this program. And I think it would hold true for Calvin's program too. So thank you so much. One more question. I want to thank you, first of all, for a very inspiring and visionary picture of what can be. Uh, I am wondering how, beyond the your ideal pictures, what kind of reception are you getting for creative change within a system that for so many, including those within the system at the warden level, at the guard level, at the prosecutor level, are ready to just punish and put people behind guards without any resources? Um, so have things changed um, or are they changing? I, I think things are changing and, and this is where I take hope. I attended a warden's conference, national warden's conference uh, last fall. And at that conference, offenders were referred to as returning citizens. And that seems to be the terminology that is being used nationwide now frequently. 
if it's not returning citizens, it's residents. Residents what is what we called our campers back when I was at Camp Brighton. Um, so I think what you call people has a lot to do with how you treat people. So that's that was heartening. The Department of Corrections has established what's what they call their offender success uh, administration. So the fact that they're focusing on offender success, I think is a real plus. They have vocational villages scattered all over the state. Uh, people learn to drive semi trucks inside the fences of a, of a prison. They learn how to um, work for Consumers Power and, and Detroit Edison uh, on, on bucket trucks and, and do wire replacement, whatever that entails. Um, they have jobs waiting for them when they walk out the door. They're interviewed in the prison and they have a job when they walk out the door. So I think there are some changes. I think as citizens, we get a choice about who we elect to various jobs. Judges are elected, prosecutors are elected. If we want change, we've got to ag agitate for change. And if prosecutors and judges are doing things that we think are not appropriate, we need to let them know that. If the Department of Corrections is doing things that we think isn't right, or your county sheriff. County sheriff's legal job is to run a jail. They do all the other stuff because they want to, or they like it, or the, the citizens want it done. But their legal description of the sheriff is the guy who, or gal who runs a jail. So if your jail isn't running the way you think it ought to, let the sheriff know. I just I just have a comment. Thank you so much for sharing. And you need to step out of retirement and go back and hear what you've done a wonderful job. Thank I you. think you heard that the last time we did this. <laughs> Thank you so much for your presentation. It was very enlightening for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.